Welcome everyone. Can you all can you okay? In the back? Yeah. Okay. So um, we're we're convening a, a panel here with um, since we have this awesome opportunity of um, Dr. Koja being here. Um, we're gonna talk a little bit about the teacher walkouts, and we have three awesome teacher activists here from the walkouts um, that were really important. And so um, my name is Anna Dyke. I'm a Assistant Professor of Curriculum Studies here at OSU. Um, I'm just gonna give you a brief introduction of our panelists um, and kick off with some questions and let them tell you a little bit more about themselves and their experiences. Um, I think one of the reasons why we wanted to do this panel um, is because um, Kim has a lot of experience doing art in the labor movement and we have this um, really exciting moment in the labor movement here in Oklahoma in education. And so just taking this opportunity to bring um, kids' experiences into conversation with our experiences here in, in Oklahoma. So um, on my left is um, Angel Worth. Angel um, is an 11th grade English teacher at Moore High School. She's currently in her third year of teaching, and she spent all three of her years in the profession in Oklahoma. She's completed her English writing degree with secondary ELA certification at the University of Oklahoma in 2015. And though she loves what she does, she, she's had to work a second job the entirety of her young career as a teacher. Such conditions are what led her to dive wholeheartedly into the teacher walkout. And her experience leading up to and during the teacher walkout inspired her to run for state office. Her bid for office fell short in the with her return to the classroom this fall has left her feeling more invested than ever in finding ways to improve the state of education in Oklahoma. Uh, in the middle, we have Heather Cody, who is an emerging leader with the Tulsa Classroom Teachers Association, the TCTA, and a third grade teacher at Bayo Demonstration School. Heather organized the March for Education during the Oklahoma Teacher Walkout in April 2018. The march was seven days and 110 miles from Webster High School in Tulsa, Oklahoma to the state capitol in Oklahoma City. Since the march, TCTA has been organizing Mile 111, in which activists from the Tulsa area are focused on electing pro-education candidates in November. Heather is a single mother of a three-year-old daughter, and her daughter's education and future are her top priority while she raises awareness of the dire need for funding of public education in our state. And we have Stephanie Price, who's a licensed, nationally certified speech language pathologist who has worked in public education since 2009. She's an activist, union member, and serves on the Education Association of Morris Minority Issues Caucus, a group dedicated to increasing racial and ethnic diversity and cultural competence in education. Stephanie is also co-founder of the nonprofit organization, Oklahoma Progressive Network, whose mission is to inform and empower voters to create meaningful change in our state. So welcome, everyone, and of course, Many of you are here, but if there's any folks who are just joining us, we have Kim Kozier, who is joining us from University of Wisconsin, Milwaukee, who's very active in the art and social justice movement there. Um, so I'm just going to start us off by asking you, I think I'll just ask a question, and then you can um, pick it up, um, and each can take a turn. Um, we'll do that for a couple rounds of questions, and then we'll open it up to have a, a bigger conversation with the audience. And this can feel pretty, you know, informal and participatory. Um, so first, if you could just share a little bit more about how you became involved in education activism um, and are in the, in the walkout. Thank you. Um, so for me, I'm only in my third year of teaching. So for me, my experience through student teaching and even my experience in getting my undergrad and certification was in the throes of budget cuts. And so my student teaching experience was one of the first years that we saw incredibly detrimental budget cuts to the point that um, students, it was the first year really students at the school that I was student teaching at, which is now the school that I'm teaching as a, as a certified teacher, uh, was the first year that they really had to deal with you know, class sets and not having enough textbooks and you know, like jokes about hashtag budget cuts, we can't have paper. And, and it just kind of became a running narrative and the rhetoric in the room it was really, it was defeating as a student teacher to see because something that students should feel like is valued um, was clearly not valued by our legislature. And so that was uh, the year that kind of pushed me my student teaching year 
to really get more involved um, to figure out what I could do beyond just you know going and being a teacher in a classroom, which is very needed in Oklahoma. So I went to my first legislative panel in, uh, in Norman, and I spoke up at a town hall and tried to figure out ways that I could really be an activist in that regard. And then uh, the teacher walkout you know, happened in my second year of teaching. So it's just kind of been one thing after the other in my rookie career. So. I get involved. Um, a lot of it started with Facebook. Um, I became a delegate for TCTA, my building delegate. Um, went to a couple meetings, became friends with Patty Burson Palmer, who was our wonderful, fearless leader. And um, she asked me, she said, if you get an email from Patty that has a calendar invite, you go. So I was in the TCTA office, and we, and Dr. Vance, our superintendent, was sitting at a big table like this, and she said, so we're really going to march. And I was like, wait, what march? What are you talking about? I thought this was a joke. And um, luckily, I'm at a school that we have a great foundation and PTA and a lot of supportive parents. And we have a great amount of money and support from our parents. And so going to meetings over and over once a month with Patty, wherever we are, and hearing all of these cries for help, I don't have chairs are broken, um, we don't have paper, can we come to the Give and Grab, what does TC TCTA have that I can use in my classroom? And knowing that I have that support at my school and seeing that no one else, a lot of schools in our district do not have that, I was like, I have the time and energy to be that activist. I have a three-year-old um, that needs a public education, I refuse to let um, her continue her private education. Right now she's in private school, and I hate it because there's so much that I learned from the public school, and I just knew that every school deserves what I have. And so I have the energy, I have the time, I'm not scrounging for resources, so let me use my time somewhere else. And it's, that's how I got here, and how, where I'll stay until it's fixed. So my first question is, should we turn it on? Um, try it. Okay. Just I thought that one was already on, but I'm Hello. <gasps> hey. Um, we can try it. Um, so, for the past 10 years, uh, five of those, I have been saying, maybe it's time to move. Um, which is a shame, because I've lived in Oklahoma since I was seven. But watching the budget cuts, over, and especially over the past five years, I'm talking like a one billion dollar budget hole for education over those years. <laughs> it's really hard. Um, it's hard as an educator who loves what she does, but it's also hard as a parent. Um, so for me, you know, it really happened in the past two years where I started to become more active with the failure of state question 779, with the step up plan, with the A plus plan. I mean, it was like one thing after another where I just felt like we kept getting punched in the gut. Every time something happened, every time something came up or there was a bill or there was somewhere where we could get support and funding for raises and for revenue for our, our classrooms, it was turned out. And I remember sitting in the Capitol um, during the vote for the step up plan. And I was like, nothing is gonna change if we don't do something to change it. And I remember thinking, we're gonna have to strike. But I didn't say it out loud. Um, so I started. <laughs> Uh, and I'm sure that's what a lot of people felt in that moment, which is why we started seeing that surge of the Facebook pages uh, just blowing up. And um, I started doing a lot of legislative research. I started looking at things, and I started speaking up and being more involved in my union. So it was kind of a, a two-year thing that blew up towards the, the end of the failure of the step. Kim, do you want to answer that question? What made you get involved in education activism? Sure. Um, so I grew up in Michigan, and that is a big union state. So I've been actually involved in um, the AFL, AFL CIO through the Oil, Chemical, and Atomic Workers Union. 
I work in the paint factory when I was younger. I've been um, a part of the laborers union for construction work that I've been doing for years. And then when I became a teacher, I was a member of NEA. Um, I'm now a member of the AFT. It's the higher ed at Eden, so I don't really have a presence there. So um, I continue to be a union member and, um, and feel um, that we need to be better about telling the story of what unionism does and you know how unions have been so central to the rise of the middle class in this country and how there has been this concerted effort over the last 25 years to, to undermine the power of the unions and to convince the public that unions are not what they are. Um, and so when I became a teacher educator, it became really important to me to continue my commitment to um, you know, this idea and to help my students see why it's important to be to band together because if we don't, we know what happens, right? And in this country that is the richest country on the face of the earth, it's obscene that teachers have to have two jobs and that children don't have paper in their classrooms, they don't have enough textbooks. I mean, it, it, it's an abomination. And so we need to start, you know, I, I think that getting that word out of changing the way we talk about this stuff to show that it's, it, you know, it's obscene, it really is, that young children are allowed to go without the proper things they need at school and that teachers don't have the proper supports and that school buildings are falling apart and full of molds and all these things. It's obscene and so we need, and you know, part of this, the artistic activism is to help to change that story because as Rebecca Sullivan says, we live by die by stories and so when you all went out on strike, I mean, it was inspirational for the entire country and probably way beyond that. I mean, it was so cool to, to, to see those images of teachers out on the streets and knowing in a more conservative state, you know, what it takes. A person who's in her second year teaching, doing that, that's incredible. That's incredible. And, I, you know, I want to be part of, like, getting that story out and, um, you know, tell that we need to be part of Um, well, I think something that um, you said, Kim, earlier in your talk is that um, we, don't, we don't often learn the story of movements or the work that goes, the kinds of um, skills and knowledge of movements of resistance. And so this next question is kind of a way of trying to um, recall that knowledge in the walkouts. So, so many folks um, on the outside, we saw the fruits, we saw the massacre. We saw everyone showing up. But um, I'm wondering if you could speak a little bit about, from your perspective, um, in, in your different sort of positions, um, the kinds of work that actually went into making the walkouts happen. Um, to piggyback kind of off of what Stephanie said, so a lot of the work that went into making the walkout happen was sitting in the gallery of the, uh, the House and the Senate watching time after time, legislators vote against education. And so I think that um, it was really just a, a tension was building. Um, and watching that build, it then became, okay, how do we harness this energy so that rather than people being defeated and watching out of Oklahoma, we can do what we did with the walkout and turn it into something positive and powerful. And even then, um, it was hard because in, in Oklahoma, strike is a dirty word. You don't do it, you can be fired. And so then it was, well, how do we convince teachers who are, are scared to lose their jobs that what we're doing is the right choice and that we can do it in such a way um, that they, you know, they don't have to fear their jobs? Because when you're a teacher, you don't make much money anyways. And so when the threat of possibly not being paid if you're gone past a certain amount of time um, arises, that's difficult to get people on board. And so uh, one of the things that I really appreciate about uh, the local union in my district is we did a really good job of spreading that information and making sure people knew exactly how long we could be out. Um, we banded together very well to pressure our district that was dragging its feet. I think you might agree, Stephanie, that was dragging its feet and <laughs> very hesitant to commit to supporting us during the walkout. Um, very, very ambiguous when it came to getting a, a yes or no, we're going to support this. Uh, and so I think a lot, of, a lot of what created getting to that point was just pulling each other up and making each other realize that this could go one of two ways. We can continue down this path and let it, you know, what's been happening, our, our state of education continues to lead to a point that we can't revitalize it, or we can take control and take it back now. So, um, 
So a lot of it happened before, but then when the walk came, this march came about, and we were sitting there, and it was not planned until to start the second week of the walkout, and for 10 days. Um, I want to say, Marty, was it the week before, maybe? The week before, we're sitting there, and I, Patty says, who wants to take responsibility for sponsors? And I, I raised my hand like this. It was a bad idea. <laughs> it was a great idea, but I was it. It the ball started like then, and Dr. Kiss, I'm sitting next to her, and she says, "Actually, I think we need to move this up. I think this is going to be the part where we show that we're serious. Like we convene that first day at the Capitol, and two days later we start. We come back and we start head on. And um, I have I have a student." Great parents. They um, he's a pastor at a local church um, in interfaith in, on the interfaith council in Tulsa, and I called him immediately after that um, meeting, and I said, "Evan, I need your help." I said, "We're really walking." You've heard this rumor around Tulsa. I said, "We're actually really going to march from Tulsa to Oklahoma City in seven days. We need food. We need places to stay. Well, what do you suggest?" Um, and so. He gave me one lady's number, and I mean everything just started falling into place. And it was the easiest job I've ever had. I would do that over and over and over again because the support of the state of Oklahoma was incredible. Um, there was not one person that came in, that we came into contact with on Route 66 that had a negative thing to say about us. Go back home, start teaching, and we um, we had started talking to schools, other school districts. We were staying in gyms on their floors, and Dr. Pace had given me all, all the superintendent's numbers, and I started calling, and is this set up, is this set up, and every one of them, we, um, so one of, I can't, I think it's Bristow, they were still in it, and one thing that you learned on this walkout, why did rural schools shut down? Why were they, why did everybody participate in this? And in Tulsa, we had so many churches and organizations, the United Way, everywhere, turn, open their doors for our children. They fed them. I mean, our kids weren't going to eat for 10 days. They opened their doors, free childcare, free food. In these small towns, they don't have it. And so you had to open your eyes to that too and know that they were still sending some buses or letting some teachers off while rolling absences so people could be, still have a presence at the Capitol. And so it just took a lot of asking and hoping that you didn't hear the word no. And we never did. I mean, not one time did we ever hear the word no. And um, when we, actually we did hear one time, but we had an anonymous donor. I mean, that got, we got to stay in a hotel one night. It was very nice. <laughs> not sure the hotel was very nice. This was in Chandler. But it was, <laughs> it was nice to sleep in a bed and not on the floor. But, um, it, I mean, there was not one person, so it, it just took a lot of asking and a lot of courage to get out of your shell and say, we need help. Are you willing to help the state of education in Oklahoma because our kids are not getting what they need? I just want to start by saying that I remember when you guys walked into town. Um, my son and I were at a friend's house. She lives right next to the Capitol, so before you all walked, to the Capitol, we saw you, and he was handing out water, and everybody was so just, ah, I can't even think of the word, English teacher, help me out. You know, like, everybody, <laughs> everybody was tired, and you could tell, but just the energy, and the love, and when the marching band came before, and it was like, yes, I mean, oh, it was really powerful. Um, so, like, talk about the creativity that it takes to organize large groups, I mean, any people, like if you're a teacher, you know what it takes to organize the classroom, <laughs> not just people in general. <laughs> so I, mean, I think that that is a creative endeavor in itself of just being able to get large groups of people to the places that you need them to be, when you need them to be there, when all the pieces fit together. That is genius in and of itself. Um, but also, figuring out ways to communicate. Uh, 
uh, figuring out ways to help people to get all the information and using things like Facebook and GroupMe and text messages and emails and I don't even know what else was going on. Um, you know, people making videos, people um, just sharing different ways of just coming together to get the word out and spread the message. Um, and then also like the planning that's involved in getting people, like, you know, getting people where they need to be and figuring out who's doing what and making all of the, the moving parts work. And I had to step back and really think about that because getting thousands of people to the same place at the same time really takes a lot of work and effort and creativity. And that was interesting to me when I started to really think about that, um, how all of that passion comes through and how we can come together to show up for what we believe in to create that movement. I just want to say that, uh, first of all, I'm just in awe of the work that we did. Um, and secondly, this idea of the passion, to say that um, I think one of the things I learned when we had, um, in 2011, our governor may you be defeated in a few days, um, you know, passed Act, or started the work of passing Act 10, which eliminated public sector unions. And um, you may remember that we descended on the um, Capitol for over a month. Um, people slept on the floor of the Capitol building, that kind of thing. But one of the things that really um, struck me in that was the love that was in that space, and, and hearing you all say that, that um, out, one of the days that, that um, I will never, it was one of the best days of my life, was the day that the 14 Democrats came back after they tried to stall the vote by leaving the, I don't know if you Made, they left the state so that a vote couldn't take place because they were outnumbered through gerrymandering and all kinds of nefarious things. But they did this heroic act, like you did, you know. And they came back because the the uh, other side maneuvered in a way that made it not matter that they were gone. And um, and this was February in Wisconsin. It was ass fighting cold. <laughs> and we, there was over 100,000 people surrounding the state capitol. And we all started chanting thank you to those people. And I have never had a more moving spiritual experience than that moment when this gratitude was going to folks who stepped up and did something, right? And so centering that idea of gratitude to one another and love for one another and, and having a kind of fierce love when you approach this work, I think is so, so important to sustaining the work because you can have that march, but you gotta keep sustaining it beyond that, right? And so how do you do that? You Partly what you do is you make, these, make this work be about caring for yourself and others and making connections to other you know, struggles. So thinking about the fight for 15, you know, here are people who are making incredible headway, by the way. Amazon is going to be paying people $15 an hour. That didn't happen because Jeff Bezos wants to pay people more. It happened because people are banding together. And so we make connections across our various struggles, too. You know, that there's this idea of intersectionality and supporting one another and giving that love beyond our own um, primary concerns, too. Um, just to me, seems like something that's really exciting that's going on in our culture right now. Kind of speaking to your point of, of gratitude and loving one another, and also the fact that Stephanie's point of, of just getting everybody organized in, in one time on the bus, I think one of the most powerful anecdotes for me, and you'll probably remember this if you were there outside the Capitol on the very first day, is when a lady lost her son. And uh, she went up on stage, yeah, she went up on stage and you could just hear the desperation in her voice and she was calling his name and somebody says, everybody take a knee. And everybody, thousands of people took a knee and her son was right there. And just in that moment you could see just the ingenuity that teachers bring to any situation. And so that was validating on the very first day, this is why we're here. Yeah. And there was no... No. I mean, it was like, everybody get down, and it just, <laughs> the crowd went down, and like, that is teachers.
teachers. Like, no, like, you know how to take care of kids. Like, ah, oh, I just, well, I just want to reemphasize something that Stephanie said. I, I'm pretty sure you said that teachers are natural organizers. So just want to put that up. Um, but you also, I think, uh, Heather, you mentioned the, the band playing when you walked in. Or Stephanie mentioned like, the band playing when you walked in. And so I wanted to just also um, think about, so a lot of what Kim was talking about earlier was thinking about the importance that art plays in, in movement building and thinking about the kinds of art we saw at the Capitol. Um, so the, the marching band was one. And is any of you more familiar with the, the marching band? Or knows how that, I know a little bit about it, but. The marching band that, that yeah. followed me in, or the marching band that was there at the Capitol? That was at the, oh, there was two different ones. Yeah, we had a uh, school band, for instance. They were not in school. I wish I could show that. Um, oh, they weren't in school. They came in, their main director came in, you know, not getting paid, not asking to do this. And it was the hottest day, by the way, of the entire seven days. We had snow. <laughs> we had rain. We had an earthquake. <laughs> and then on the last day, it was 90 degrees. 85 degrees, and walking in, and these four kids, it was so hot. I mean, it was the most amazing situation. So it was not the marching band there. But we did have a guy that came from Mr. Aaron Baker from Mid Dell. And he actually traveled up to Tulsa and marched back home with us. And he wrote songs the entire And so, I mean, that, I mean, sign making, even though it seems small, like people were putting their heart and soul, they, just because their feet were tired, just because their body was tired, their mind was not tired, and it continued the entire time. And it was our pick me up, or maybe our kumbaya circle that <laughs> got us back. You know, there were some days, I mean, there were some struggling. There was one day that we were in Stroud, we had to call off the march because of lightning into Stroud's amazing center gymnasium and people walked 187 laps around to make sure they got every single inch in about 110 miles in seven days. And just, we sat, we were there for so long in this one building without seeing outside. It was cold, that, that also ice that night. And so, I mean, we were just inside and we were talking, Aaron playing his guitar and singing to us just being able to, actually that's the day that Fall and Dice also passed, and so it was a victory in itself too, and so it was celebratory, it was all of these things, and just having Aaron there, being able to bring his music into this, it helped so much. Any other questions? I don't know. <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean. Because I'm so ready to jump on to the uh, question. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so I originally, when I when I thought about art and the teacher walkout, I was like, I don't know, I mean, we showed up and we were there and we chanted a lot, and I don't know, but then I started to think about, I'm an English teacher, and so I am a huge believer in the power of symbols, and so before the teacher walkout happened, we had a board meeting um, in Moore, and I showed up in my second job uniform, because I felt like that was a powerful symbol. And then um, when we got to the walkout, one of the people that used to teach drama at my high school had a couch, like it set up a living room kind of, yes. Yeah. Um, on you know the grounds of the Capitol. And there was another teacher there who was having class, like had a classroom set up, right? And so all of these symbols were just so incredibly powerful that the teaching doesn't stop, and we're you know we're here and we're invested. And and so for me, connecting art and the walkout was just there was so much symbolism was pervasive throughout the entire movement. All right. Um, I was thinking about this, and one of my favorite parts was, and it seems really obvious, but it, like making signs, posters. I mean, our, the union had a sign making party, and I remember my son and I, who I just have to give him a shout out because he's like my honorary teacher. He was up with me at the Capitol every day of the walkout, except for one. I mean, he was there, and um, I remember sitting with him in our kitchen and making signs, and coloring and drawing, and all the attention to detail, and he was just as passionate 
crowded as I was, um, but like seeing everybody's side, going and seeing everything that people had come up with and just the creativity and the time that it takes. And that was amazing, number one. Um, T-shirts were also a big thing. Like the, the connecting people together, the building of morale by people designing T-shirts and talking about you know, the colors to wear and what kinds of t-shirt designs that they could come up with that would be symbolic for them and, and their districts. And so I think that that was another thing for me. Um, there was one day where, and correct me if I'm wrong, we, they, they gathered people together on the lawn mm -hmm. to spell out capital gains. Yeah. Okay, yeah. I, I, capital gains, yeah. because they would not, they would not hear capital gains. And so the bodies of educators being moved into these into these letters to form words, and they were taking pictures from above to, to spell capital gains. I mean, that is movement, and like to me, that is art. Yeah. Um, I just uh, I'm so passionate about it. You can tell. <laughs> um, also, something for me. So the, the Capitol building was packed. I mean, there were times where we were in line for an hour to get into the building, to get upstairs. I figured out that I could like sneak through if I used the elevator and then went, you know. But um, times that we, it was packed, I couldn't go into the bathroom without like a million people being in there. And so I got sent back as a delegate for the district after the walkout had ended. They were selling, uh, selling, excuse me, they weren't selling anything. No money was involved. I was not a big protester. Um, <laughs> They were sending groups back, and I happened to go into the bathroom, and it was completely empty, and I just looked around at the walls, and I started singing. Um, I'm a singer, so I started singing just so I could hear the sound like, coming back at me, and just to hear what it sounded like with nobody in there. It was amazing. Um, but I think that, you know, all of that to say, like, those things, the t-shirts, the signs, the moving our bodies to spell words, the sh you know, showing up, and um, the creativity. It's an expression of the emotion and um, how we were able to process that experience because I know for me, anyway, it was an emotional roller coaster. I mean, it was up and down and up and down. There were days that I cried there were days that I laughed. There were days that I was mad. There were days that there were all three going on at the same time. Um, it was it was a very intense experience. Um, the chance, the chance, like being packed into the halls of the Capitol with hundreds of people, and we're all there together, and we're chanting, "Where's my car?" <laughs> and many other things. So I feel like all of that um, is a very emotional thing that kind of brought us all together. We were there for the same goal and the same purpose. And it was it was wonderful to experience that with other passionate educators. And it's hard teachers to, to silence the rotunda <sighs> in like five seconds flat yes. to start the next chant. Yes. Yeah. Amazing. <laughs> Agreed. <laughs> I, I just have to mention this marching band really quick. So you all, many of you probably know there was a marching band that was created and put together by a, a marching band teachers. Um, and they composed basically like movement songs and they played them in the Capitol. But they created a songbook that they passed on to Arizona. And then Arizona created a marching band of band teachers, and they used Oklahoma Songbook in their strength, which I thought was really good. Yeah. And also on uh, NPR, uh, they were talking about uh, the writer of uh, We're Not Gonna Take It, and how that song had been used basically to the Oklahoma walkout version, and it was natural to use that one song. <laughs> so this is my final question for you all, and then we'll open it up. Um, the future. So you all are involved in, in building things right now. If you could talk a little bit more about that and what 
what you want to see coming out of coming out of the walkouts and just hearing you talk about all these passions and the, the where do we get strength next? No. <laughs> <laughs> We are about three weeks, three weeks out, I think, from seeing the fruit of our labor. Um, I want to see teachers in the legislature, and I think that that's one yes. Um, uh, that's where my focus and energy has been, is finding ways to get education candidates the resources that they need, because a lot of the candidates who are pro-education are also candidates who don't take money from um, oil interests and, and corporate interests. And so um, I've you know, been helping out floors and canvassing and, uh, and organizing forums where I'm, we're trying to organize one right now in our district where we can get pro-education candidates and incumbents in a room um, together because I think that would be the most for them is to have them side by side with the people they're running against. And so um, beyond the, uh, the election, beyond the rate, I, I didn't actually really think about it until last week we were sitting in our legislative action committee and, and Zach asked, so what's next? And I was like, I don't even know. I haven't thought about it, you know? Uh, but I think that that will between the election season and the next session is going to be incredibly important to do to maintain our momentum and carry our energy. And so finding ways to innovatively uh, keep people engaged, um, particularly pending the results of the election, because it, it might be pretty defeating if we don't see the change we want to see. I don't feel like that's going to happen. But, uh, but you know, we need to be prepared for that as well. So just basically writing the political leaf and trying to, um, to harness that energy. After the walkout and it being ended so abruptly, I felt like um, we sat around the table again and said, what's next? What do we do next? Hunger strike was on the table. It was not for that one. Um, sleeping on Capitol lawn. We didn't want to get arrested. We still needed to go back to work. All these things were happening. So what was next? So mile 111 came about. And um, I have not been as active in that. I'm not saying that I haven't been campaigning and all that, but I haven't been in the organizing side of that. Um, Patty always taught us, you know, you send on the organization, you teach other people to organize to keep it going. And so, you know, we were at the first couple planning meetings and then we just kind of, we, I, we, I have um, my twin that helped us a lot, Kate Baker, she was amazing. Um, she, and so we just came, we ordered, uh, facilitated the first couple meetings and then you know, all these other people that saw the organization through the march and what can we do next? What or or even people that decided to march a couple of days and then say, Oh no, I'm not done. What can I do next? I my feet can walk, so I'm ready to walk some door uh, knock some doors or drive. They couldn't they didn't want to walk anymore and um, so we've been very, very politically active and um, bipartisan for pro education we have four TCTA members right now that are still up for November, and we've been very, very catched on getting that out, getting their names out, and, um, and what is next? We have not asked that question, and that's kind of terrifying, but we have not answered that yet, and um, we will see what is next, but definitely keep pushing, and hopefully, like you said, come November 6th, we're not defeated. So, we don't have to do it anymore. <laughs> 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 Angel mentioned one thing that my district is doing, our, the union uh, set up a legislative action committee uh, to kind of help pe pe keep people engaged and um, help us know what's going on. I, I think that for me, one thing is building the union membership and talking to people about the importance of being in a union. Um, because even if you weren't happy with what how it played out with the Oklahoma union, there's still a lot of work to be done within local unions. Um, and I think that's important, keeping people engaged. We can't necessarily harness the momentum from the strike because that is a surge that happens that's created by the passion of so many people coming together um, and it's it's really difficult to harness that but what you can do is organize beneath the surface so you can create the level of organization that you need to be able to act quickly and get information out quickly and keep people informed and keep people engaged um, and I think that is also really important 
for me personally, one thing is building and strengthening um, diversity and understanding of diversity and cultural competence and social justice in, in my district because I went to a conference um, in the summer and it was basically, the discussion came up of how are we tying together the strike wave with the movement for social justice and for our, our students of color um, and our indigenous students to have representation in education. And that hit me like a ton of bricks because it's something that's very important to me and I, I live that daily. So figuring out how to tie those two movements together is really important for me and that's work that I'm gonna continue doing. Um, I think it's naive to say that everything will change in November, but it is important to be hopeful that we can get candidates, we can get people elected who are, care about what we're doing, who are passionate about kids and passionate about education and see that we need to educate our children because they are our future, but also we have to be organized and we have to be prepared to fight back when we need to fight back. And that is part of kind of continuing into moving on to the next phase of after the walkout and continuing the momentum. I don't want to be the last word because you are the main, the main attraction here, but I will say that, um, you know, this idea about um, remaining active, and I started my talk with a slide about feelings being a cause and a solution to all our problems. It's, that is true, and unions are no different, right? So um, people can say, well, unions are corrupt or they're flawed, or, and I don't know enough about your states, um, but it sounds like there's some issues there, and I know in um, in other states, that the union didn't want teachers to go on strike and it anyway. Um, so getting involved in leader, union leadership too and pushing the union is really important. And also I think that taking a step back a bit and seeing about, you know, like thinking about this idea of what is the world we want to live in. Because if we just put candidates forward who work within a system that as it is, we're not going to make headway because the system is really corrupt. It doesn't matter which side of the aisle you're on. It's all wrapped up with corporate interests. And so if we don't take a page out of some other people, you know, the, I don't think of the way the Tea Party sort of sidetracked the way, you know, politics went in that sense. If we don't make noise and push back, um, it'll get absorbed. But, you know, the work that we do will get absorbed into a system that is, is problematic. And, um, you know, I think about back in Wisconsin, we, we raised, we got 200, 2 million signatures to recall the governor. And there was so much energy. People were out there, 2 million signatures. And then the Democratic Party took over and screwed the pooch, and we lost that election. They ran the same guy that lost to him the first in the first place, who was like Marvin Milk Toast, you know. And so he, I call him Mr. Marshmallow. He's like our he's our mayor. He's you know, a random guy, but you know it's just pathetic. And so like as soon as the establishment took over, it just went down the toilet. And so we have to push back, and we you know you can't. It's not enough to win. You know, let's hope that you do win, but. We, we got to keep pushing to change the system because it's not a system that cares about people, it's a system that cares about corporations and that, that just has to be, and it's only the people that can stand up and make a change in that sense, so. We have time for a few questions. Two questions. The first is what, um, what was it like getting back into the classroom with students because it seems like Speaking to the question of what's next, like the repercussions of that action on students' lives, it being an experience that they'll hopefully remember forever and will learn from, seems like a pretty powerful thing. So I wonder what that was like for you all. And the second um, is I wonder what you all think about the state question 801, um, because it's confusing to me and I don't know the right way. And, um, just the, the language is a little, I think, um, clouded and uh, pretty vague. So I was hoping that someone might have some opinion people might not share. So if I can answer 
your second question first, and I'm sure the angel has a lot to say about it also. I'm probably just gonna read it. Just yeah. knowing what I know about you. Um, so, I actually did an interview with the superintendent of Blanchard Public Schools, uh, Jim Beckham, and uh, State Representative Jacob Rosecrans about state question 801. I do not support state question 801. I think that it's a shell game to move money from one place to another place to continue to cause distraction uh, from fully funding education. Um, <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> Anything that Mary Fallon is going to push at me, I'm automatically like, nope. <laughs> Where's my car? I'm a greedy teacher. But you need to tell like, that story about the car. You need to remind them of the story. Oh, you, okay. Very quickly. Please don't let me lose track of your first question. Um, when we went on strike, Mary Fallon, our wonderful governor, basically said that teachers are like greedy teenagers who just want everything, and we want a new car, and we want all this and that, but we need to just be happy with what we got and get back in the classroom. So that's why we were in the Capitol saying, where's my car, jangling our keys, because <laughs> she had the audacity to call us greedy for wanting um, fair compensation for our level of education and our, our work, um, and for wanting our students to have fully funded classrooms. So yeah, yeah. Um, all right, first question was, what was it like going back? I cried. I walked into my room, and I'm elementary. Um, I walked into my room the first day back. I had already had a rough, year, um, and I cried because, number one, I was sad that I, I felt like our students still didn't get everything they deserved, um, and number two, because of the abruptness with which we were set back, um, not statewide, but district-wide. It was, for us, I mean, it was very abrupt. Um, so I cried, and but for my students, it was like I had just seen them. Yesterday. I mean, they didn't even. It, 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 Were there conversations with the students about. With the, mine? No. I bet with some of the older students, yes. But with mine, no. It was like, hey, awesome, you're back, let's do this. Um, so their fire ignited me, but we didn't, we didn't have conversations about it. So, no. But state question 801, no. No. <laughs> First question. I agree with 801, but um, when we went back, our district, we actually had, I think it ended on Thursday, Friday we were still closed, Monday teachers came back, kids came back Tuesday. So we had a day as a staff to reconnect. When we walked in on Monday morning, I may cry right now, um, our parking lot was completely decorated. Our students had came out and chopped our entire parking lot. Um, our PTA had came in and um, had a breakfast taco bar for us, and they sat and conversated with us, just talked with us and telling us thank you for doing this for their kids. Tuesday kids came back, and um, I spoke with Evan Taylor earlier. His son was in my class, and he says, well, you got your raise, what about mine? And I said, I'm trying, you know, we're trying. I mean, his dad had opened his church doors and I'm pretty sure all 20 of my students were at Evan's church for 11 days and Evan was like, get them out of here. <laughs> I'm done, I don't know how you do this. <laughs> this is ridiculous, <laughs> take these kids back. And so, you know, it, that's just his son. He was just like, where's my race, Miss Cody? And I was like, I'm trying, I, we were trying. And, this fight's not over. They knew that we had gotten our raises, at least at my school, they knew that we had gotten our raises, but they had it. And that's the way they looked at it, because we had a long conversation with them before we left. This is not about me. I, I don't come here. If I wanted to make a million dollars, I would not be a teacher, especially in the state of Oklahoma. I knew that coming into it. And so 
we had that conversation before we left. This is for you, and we care about you, and these are for our friends across the state, not just us. And so they were, it was kind of a joke, but also, I mean, he wanted to know, why didn't we get everything? And so that conversation came about. We said, our, you know, our work's not done, we'll continue. So. So we're just about out of time, so I think by closing, just give you an opportunity to answer that question. Really quick, I don't want, I agree with what Stephanie said. I hope it's, in, I, I feel that it's important, though, to also say that Eight hundred one would be great for suburban schools that don't really have any problems, anyways. Yes. Um, Eight hundred one, however, would do nothing to solve the disparity and inequity um, between suburban schools and rural and urban schools, and so it's very dangerous. Um, it would be a great thing because I know my district, I know my community, and they would go through teacher pay raises like crazy. But that does nothing to keep good teachers in classrooms with kids who are specially needed. Um, so I'm very much against Eight hundred one. In terms of what it was like going back to the classroom, I couldn't go back. Say it didn't feel like we it didn't feel like we could accomplish what we had gone through, and so I held out as long as I could. It was on my personal leave. Uh, I had my kids text me on their mind. When are you coming back? You know, this stuff sucks. <laughs> um, and so I decided I decided to uh, to run for office because I felt that if I was going to go back to my students, um, I was going to go back with promises that I could try to keep. Um, and despite not winning my primary. Um, just, I think, seeing me step up was enough. And I didn't talk about it with my kids, really, because if there's a fine line that fits there, they knew. And they saw my name on signs around town. And they, they, they knew. Um, and so, uh, and then also we did do, like, a whole diagram of the budgeting thing. And this is what, you know, we accomplished, and this is what we need. And I had this, and they were so, it's so interesting. When you're not trying to actually teach your curriculum, your kids are so attentive, <laughs> right? <laughs> Uh, but I'm trying to give them anything to do with mice and men. It's, it's you know, like herding cats. But when it comes to actually like real world issues and when they feel like they're being treated seriously and informed, those conversations were enriching and beautiful. So I think if you ever do get to office, I, I think the legislature needs to go back to their districts and spend a week in a school. Um, just as a parent going to the front office watching what comes in. <laughs> that and just to be mindful of time or so I want to wrap it up and just say thank you again so much for sharing your